Good evening. Are we ready to start? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of our TAP talks to introduce you to the idea of TAP. TAP is the art platform India that was launched in early September. This is a collective of galleries from across India uh, who have focused on Indian art. Uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, we were all wondering about what to do. And a lot of us were talking to each other and we realized we needed to collaborate and get together. And that's how TAP India was born. Uh, we have uh, all had a very uh, interesting last couple of months putting this platform together. Uh, let's say it's a work in progress and we're still evolving it and it's going to evolve into something that we hope all of you will log into and enjoy in the coming months. The idea is that we have uh, 14 galleries at the moment and each gallery is uh, functioning independently. They will show a collection and we will change this collection periodically. Uh, we will also have a curated section which will show curated exhibitions from the group as well as curated exhibitions uh, from outside. Uh, this has been a very rewarding last few months, uh, though not everybody has thought so. A lot of our friends who've uh, been around were wondering what we were up to and TAP is the result of what we have been up to. And this is the first of our talks. We are so, so lucky that we have Dr. Madhuvanti Ghosh, who has agreed to be our first speaker. And we have been lucky to collaborate with the, uh, the United States, um, uh, uh, United States uh, Information and Broadcasting Service who, and the uh, embassy who has agreed to partner with us in this uh, talk. So welcome everybody. And I'm going to go on to uh, Malik Barkana, who uh, is the the cultural attache for the embassy. He has come into India uh, in Chennai in 2018. Uh, he's, I think, had an eventful few months with, with uh, his introduction here. And it's, it's an unusual introduction, I'd say, because of what we've been through in the last six months. So I'll leave it to Malik to introduce the program that he's working on before I introduce our speaker for the evening. Over to you, Malik. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. And I'll say good evening and vanakam to everyone. Uh, the US Consulate General in Chennai is delighted to partner with the art platform India, TAP India, and this talk led by Dr. Madhuvanti Ghosh. Uh, we thank you very much for this invitation, Sharon. The consulate is very proud to be part of this initiative. Just last week, I was reading in the press about this and I thought what a great idea it is during these challenging times that you have a collective of people who care about the arts and think together about ways to make things better and to persevere during these challenging times. I came to India as a young man uh, more than 25 years ago for the first time I uh, visited India and since then I've developed a deep appreciation for Indian culture, philosophy, religion, the arts. And um, actually, I had a previous diplomatic tour in Kolkata as well. So in my entire life, I've probably spent five to six years of it in India. And I have a, a very deep appreciation for this culture. Um, so in terms of um, work at the consulate, we also realize that the arts and culture are important parts of connecting people connecting countries, connecting organizations and individuals. And I just wanted to share a few highlights of some of the work that the consulate's been doing to support the arts. Uh, last year, July, in July and August, the US Embassy in, Nel in New Delhi supported an All India Museum Summit, which brought together more than 150 museum professionals and curators to brainstorm ideas on how to make museums better and more appropriate for the 21st century. The US diplomatic mission in India has also sponsored very many cultural preservation sites, including documentation of endangered musical traditions in Western Rajasthan 
and conservation of Humayun's tomb complex gateway in New Delhi. Closer to home, we've worked with the Oriental Research Institute in Mysore to restore rare manuscripts. And we also supported the restoration of 21 ceiling panels at the Senate Hall at the University of Madras here in Chennai. We've also supported a range of musical performances and dance. We had the Paul Taylor Dance Company here a few years ago. And just before the lockdown in March, we were very lucky to have an American bluegrass band and it featured uh, local musicians, Mandalan Rajesh and Alap Raju. Finally, the consulate has also supported many local arts festivals, including the Kochi Museris Biennale, the Chennai Photo Biennale, the Hindu Lit Fest, the Metro Plus Theater Fest, and many film shows. So that's just a little bit of an idea of what the consulate is doing to work on cultural diplomacy as we bridge our connections between the United States and India. I'm, I congratulate you on the TAP India initiative and for this TAP talk series. We're happy to be part of this first one and we look forward to similar events in the future. Back over to you and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Madhuvanti Ghosh. Madhu, as we've all known her, thank you so much, Madhu, for agreeing to be part of, of this. Thank you. We are so grateful to have you and we're very honored to have you. So Dr. Madhuvanti Ghosh is the Alsof Associate Curator for Indian, Southeast Asian and Himalayan Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, she is responsible for the exhibition, the collections, the preservation and the research of the museum's permanent collection in these areas. Between 2012 and 2016, Ghosh led the Vivekananda Memorial Program for Museum Excellence with the Government of India that was designed to foster professional exchanges between the Art Institute and various museums in India. This resulted in the introduction of the Jatan program across 10 museums of India and the creation of the Museums of India web portal. At present, she's leading a series of workshops on museum curation for the American Institute of Indian Studies at, as part of the strengthening of the ties between the US and, and India. And this is supported by the US mission to India. Ghosh serves on the executive committee uh, of the board of trustees of the American Association of Art Museum Curators and the vice presidents of its governance and nominating committee. She is the recipient of the Center for the Curatorial Leadership and Fellowship. She has a PhD from the University of London and was previously a lecturer at SOAS. Her current research interests include the history of Indian art studies and exhibitions in the West after 1947, and the Indian uh, cultural doyen, Pupul Jaikar, and the textiles of undivided Bengal. Now she's curated a lot of very important exhibitions of contemporary art, one of it being the public notice three by Jitesh Kalat, which she's going to tell you about. The other one was Zarina, paper like skin, and I'm not going to mention all of them because I think she's going to talk about all of this. And uh, basically she has uh, spearheaded bringing contemporary Indian art to the Art Institute of Chicago. And this has been made Indian art, the contemporary Indian art world very visible. She's also found a way to bridge the traditional and the contemporary. And she's going to talk about this and introduce you to the entire subject. So we thought it would be very appropriate since all of us are thinking about how to expand, how to look at things. So thank you, Madhu. So over to you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Sharon, for that warm introduction. And uh, I too am grateful uh, to the US um, uh, mission in India and particularly uh, the one in Chennai for um, helping us host this event along with TAP India, which sounds like a wonderful initiative. We all need to be buying more and more art in these times. Um, I'm going to start by, uh, if you don't mind, sharing my screen, uh, and then we can um, OK. Can everyone see the screen? 
All good? Yes, yes, we're okay. Excellent, thank you. So um, as Sharon was saying, um, it's, you would imagine that um, developing contemporary and modern Indian art uh, would be something automatic and simple. But I want to share with you some of my experiences, uh, particularly in the United States, um, in a major institution like the Art Institute of trying to push the needle um, in getting our collections to represent Indian art in all its variety, and also the challenges that we face, which uh, I think people need to be more conscious of because sitting in India or sitting anywhere else outside of the United States, you might imagine that why is it a challenge? Why do you need to think about strategies um, uh, in order to um, uh, develop a collection or to uh, display uh, Indian modern and contemporary art? And I hope that my talk today will illuminate some of the challenges that actually all museums in the West face, but particularly those in the United States um, with regard to the modern and contemporary Indian art scene. And, and to a certain extent that can be extended to other parts of the world too, uh, which are kind of non-West essentially. So, um, but I'm going to stick my, stick today to just talking about the situation with Indian art. So um, 13 years ago, uh, I was appointed as the Ulstof uh, Curator at the Art Institute. And um, there was a collection of Indian art, but it was primarily sculpture and painting, uh, which was primarily pre 19th century at that time. And um, besides that, the only things that we had that were in the even the 20th century uh, were a few photographs uh, uh, by Raghubir Singh because in uh, 1999, the Art Institute had done an exhibition um, uh, of Raghubir Singh's uh, photographs. And so um, we acquired a few at that time. And along with that, we had the gift uh, in our collections of this uh, Hussein work, uh, this untitled work, um, which you will hear much more about as this lecture unfolds. So this was all that we had uh, with regard to the 20th century when I came there. Now, I don't have to say this to all of you because most of you will be conscious of this already, but essentially, um, Indian art doesn't stop at a particular time. Uh, just because uh, the museum had not collected um, extensively in the 20th century, um, Indian art continued to be produced, as we all know, across uh, time and right down to today. So it was really a challenge to understand and to kind of think about how to um, deal with this and how to represent Indian art across periods uh, within our collections, which were known for its collection of Indian sculpture, particularly medieval Indian sculpture. Um, we had, uh, and we continue to have, uh, an incredibly beautiful collection of Indian sculptures of all periods and Indian paintings, but it was really the 20th century and the 21st century that we lacked. Um, and I should say that while my position was endowed and I had uh, uh, new galleries that I was installing um, when I came, um, we didn't have acquisition funds and we continue not to have acquisition funds in my area that are specific to uh, the growth of Indian modern or contemporary Indian art. Um, and that makes it also more difficult to uh, just go and shop. Uh, we, most curators don't have that freedom, um, you know, in areas that are uh, being developed more recently, like uh, the Art Institute was doing in the case of Indian art. So, um, so those were the kind of the situation that I faced when I first arrived. Um, and this talk is a little bit about what's happened 
in the last 13 years. So one of the strategies for trying to deal with this was that um, with the support of our director, we started to do a series of exhibitions. Because first of all, we had to bring Indian art out to the public domain. Now, we started with Indian contemporary and there was a reason why. Um, at the time that I arrived, uh, there was, um, we were building and we were about to open the modern wing of the Art Institute. So across the museum, there was a great deal of conversations about the modern. Um, but what was really strange for someone like me coming from Britain at that time was that, of course, that modern that we were talking about was essentially Western modernism. Um, the building that was being created, which is called the modern wing, um, is essentially uh, at that time was, you know, we had planned to show Western art. Um, so um, there was no question of discussing other modernisms or Indian modernism. And so it seemed like the, um, the place to start was not modern, but in fact, contemporary Indian art. And that too, um, if you remember the kind of mid, uh, th that whole period of the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a series of these group shows, artists group shows across the world, you know, introducing Indian contemporary art across the world. Well, that was not the uh, route that we took. Instead, what we did was we focused a lot on individual artists and trying to help them get better known to our local audiences. And I started uh, because it was happen chance that I uh, met the artist Jitish Kalat. And um, he was talking to me about this idea of this project that he had, which he called Public Notice 3. Um, because he had done public notice one and two previously. Um, and he really wanted to do this work in situ at the Art Institute. And initially when I met him in 2009 and we started to talk about this work, I really did not imagine that we would be able to accomplish it. And that was because of the situation at that time of you know, the conversation around the modern, the conversations around um, uh, essentially modern meaning Western modern, uh, there was really, um, it was difficult to make people focus on uh, Indian art, uh, which was essentially contemporary at that time. Um, but I think some projects are just meant to happen. And in our case, um, I think a lot of um, the stars aligned and we were able to open um, a public notice three. Um, the reason why this work was so important to Chicago and the reason why Jitish wanted to do it at the Art Institute of Chicago is related to the history of the building of the Art Institute and the fact that it is connected to um, Swami Vivekanand. It is at the Art Institute of Chicago that um, uh, you know, the, the first building of the Art Institute, which you see in this uh, vintage photograph, uh, was built right at the time of the World Columbian Exposition. And it is this uh, exposition that had the Parl uh, Parliament of World Religions, uh, which was in fact the space, uh, two of the spaces within the Art Institute as you enter the building is where uh, this parliament of world religions took place. And those are the two spaces that I identify here in this plan. Um, one is our Hall of Columbus and the other was uh, the space which is today our library. And uh, it is in that space, um, the Hall of Columbus, where uh, in 1893 on 9-11 that uh, the inaugural session took place. And it is in that inaugural session that Swami Vivekanand um, uh, got up right at the end and made his great speech of Sisters and Brothers of America, uh, which electrified that audience. And that was all people talked about the next day in the newspapers in Chicago. 
So um, it was that connection to the Art Institute and to that speech that Jitish was attracted. And the fact that it happened on 9-11, this speech, which um, is all about tolerance, happened on a day that now we associate with intolerance, essentially. And so it was that juxtaposition of the two events that um, was very attractive to Jitish. It's this space, uh, Fullerton Hall, where that um, speech happened, uh, the, where the inaugural um, uh, uh, session happened and where Sisters and, and Brothers of America was spoken. And what we decided to do, because Vivekanan spoke in the two spaces that are adjacent to each other, in the middle of which is our grand staircase, we decided to put the speech on this grand staircase and um, opened it on 9-11, 10 years ago today. And that's how it looked on the grand staircase. So the two spaces on either side of it are the two spaces that the halls were um, where um, the World Parliament of Religions took place. And um, the speech was put in LED lights um, and the LED lights were, um, that we used um, were uh, based on the colors that at that time were, um, everybody talked about these, uh, the Homeland Security Advisory System. And we, it felt as though um, for years, we were always on code orange. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's, it's strange that we had forgotten that actually, the Homeland Security Advisory System actually did have other col colors in its palette. And it was those colors, the whole range of colors that Jitish decided to put the words of Swami Vivekanand in. And as you can see um, on either side of the staircase, you start with the word sisters and brothers of America. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable. And then the speech literally goes up as you walk up the stairs. And then uh, our staircase uh, divides into the four cardinal directions. And so the speech itself spreads in these four cardinal directions. And it feels as though the words go into the ether because our building, the, the first building at the Art Institute, uh, for various reasons, we never built its dome. So it really feels as though, you know, uh, in India, we have this belief that, you know, great words go into the into the different directions. And that is how the speech kind of splits up and goes into the ether. Uh, and this is that uh, uh, space where it goes into the four directions. And uh, right at the uh, middle of this kind of platform are these beautiful, uh, this beautiful verse from the Bhagavad Gita that um, Swamiji spoke about as the different streams having their sources in different places all mingle their water in the sea. So, oh Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. So, so of course, the, the different parts of the speech were you know, very thoughtfully put in places where people could kind of sit and uh, read them if they wanted. But other than that, the idea was that as people walked up and down the staircase, they were constantly coded in these uh, colors of Homeland Security. Um, one of the other things that I want to talk about is the fact that an exhibition like this, an installation like this, um, which in fact we had planned for um, to be up like every other normal exhibition for three months, um, we had such a lot of um, public, um, uh, you know, the public were just crazy about this work. Even today we get, you know, asked about what happened to the work, when are we planning to bring it out again? Um, so because of the kind of public reaction that the work uh, attracted, the installation was um, uh, kept up for six months and eventually it closed uh, one year after um, the date that we planned. So the, the important thing about um, exhibitions is not only the fact that they impact the public imagination, but also they lead to gifts and they lead to um, uh, acquisitions. 
And um, the important thing about Public Notice 3 was that Jitish, in his great generosity, gifted this work in perpetuity to the Art Institute. So Public Notice 3 is forever linked to the Art Institute and became our first kind of contemporary work um, that we acquired for the collection. And as this talk progresses, you will see that growth of that collection through the strategy of doing a series of exhibitions, um, because that is one way of um, impacting people and particularly our patrons who then work with us to create those acquisitions or those gifts for a museum. And this is essentially the way in which uh, museums in America work. So it's not something that is unique to the Art Institute. I just happen to be sharing that example with all of you. So this was a judicious gift. And um, we are so uh, proud of this work um, and the impact it's had on the field of Indian contemporary art in the US, because it really was uh, a milestone in uh, how Indian contemporary art has crossed over, especially in America. Now, um, moving on from there, uh, we continue to engage our public with Indian contemporary artists uh, one at a time. Um, and we were really honored um, uh, when uh, Amar Kanwar was chosen to present our Spire lecture, which is the most important lecture, named lecture series that we have at the Art Institute, uh, named after James Spire, that is given by a living artist. So, Amar was the first um, Indian contemporary artist, well, actually the first non-Western living artist to be invited to present the spire. And um, simultaneously, we showed his lightning testimonies. Um, Amar since then has gone on to have several works in our collection, but uh, one of the most momentous was when we showed the lightning testimonies at the Art Institute. Um, it, it, even today, there are a lot of people who remember how, um, what it felt like to see this work there. And we continued this. Um, Zarina, people like screen, screen, uh, Skin, sorry, was not um, curated by us. Um, uh, it was actually curated by The Hammer uh, in LA. And, uh, but we were very uh, honored to be part of the uh, tour of this exhibition. So I, I worked with our contemporary department to organize the show at the Art Institute. Um, it had gone from the Hammer to Guggenheim and then came to us. And um, it was just the most incredible experience to work with Zarina. Um, but what was even more wonderful was to then try to um, get, um, uh, you know, work with our patrons to not only make this exhibition happen, because of course we needed to raise the funds to make this exhibition happen, but also to then add a few Zarina works into our collection. So uh, again, you will see that it started off with a gift that Zarina herself made to us. And then we have worked with um, many of our patrons um, who acquired Zarina's works like this one, for example, um, and uh, then it was gifted to the Art Institute. And we ourselves also went forward and made some acquisitions at the time. Because when you have an exhibition um, and there's a focused attention on um, that artist, it's kind of easier to bring that artist into that collection at that time, because the train moves on if you don't take that moment uh, and, and add to the collection. And uh, photography, in fact, has been one of the areas where the Art Institute has consistently added um, Indian um, artists. And uh, I was really happy to collaborate with our photography department to do this um, uh, exhibit of some of Dianita Singh's works um, back in 2014. And uh, we showed two bodies of her work that uh, eventually both uh, came into our collections. Museum of Chance and myself, Mona Ahmad. And we continue to acquire um, Adainita's works on a regular basis because in many cases, um, many of our patrons acquire uh, Dianita's works and then they're very um, kind and generous to donate them to us. 
uh, to gift them to us. So here's an example of the file room um, uh, body of work, which was then uh, gifted to us. And I'm just showing you just one example of many works. Um, there was a time when our uh, director, um, Douglas Druig, really encouraged uh, several of us curators, which was really kind of unthinkable at that time, to not only collaborate um, uh, about uh, Indian art and to work collectively in around that 2013, 2014 time, but to actually also travel together. And um, which is something that is very rare. Curators never get to work, uh, you know, travel with their colleagues. But we actually got to travel in India. Um, and um, one of the projects that came out of this travel and this, um, uh, uh, this collaboration, uh, particularly between uh, the contemporary department and the Asian department was uh, this exhibition of Nilima Sheikh's works where we borrowed um, from um, some of the most important patrons of Indian contemporary art from across the world. Uh, the works that she had done from her series each night put Kashmir in your dreams and then she also added um, a few works that she made specially for our um, exhibition and uh, those new works were then added um, we acquired one and one of our trustees acquired the other so I'm showing you particularly those two works um, here's the work that was acquired by us we Must Bear, which was uh, done specifically for this exhibition. And uh, Hunarmand, which is an exquisite double-sided scroll, uh, which was acquired by one of our trustees. Um, and it has really been this, this process of us working collectively across different departments that has led to this development of Indian contemporary art across the museum. And I'd just like to share one tiny story with all of you, which is that um, uh, we were traveling to India frequently and uh, every time we'd visit uh, Anju Dodia in her studio, we would glance at this particular work, Changing Skin, which was in her personal collection. And we would all look at it very closely, especially our director, and uh, we would say, oh my God, we really need to acquire this work. Uh, you know, we really need to, you know, as we would be leaving her place, we would always say, you know, we really need to acquire, uh, you know, works by Anju for the collection. And it was this work that would always draw our attention. It was a work that she'd done for um, her big installation at the Baroda Lakshmi Vilas Palace. And it got so embarrassing that we had, um, I think probably said this, I mean, unconsciously, like about two or three times every time we happened to be visiting her. And finally, I think um, uh, in 2014, our director got so embarrassed because, you know, like it was just something that just automatically came out of us every time we happened to see this work um, that he said, you know what, this time we just have to acquire this. Anju, do you mind? We'd really, really like to uh, acquire this work of yours, which she had kept for herself. But it was just something that we had to have. We couldn't like comment on it anymore. We just like had to get the deal done. Um, and she was very kind to part with it. And um, it today is part of our really renowned prints and drawings collection. So what we have done over a period of time is uh, worked with particularly our patrons to develop our collections and um, Sometimes they can be gifts in honor of an important trustee or an important board member, uh, like in this case uh, with this uh, Kate Bresson, uh, or it could be uh, helping us acquire something that we really want, um, as in the case of this uh, Gauri Gill series, Jannat. Uh, or for example, Diwali Mela, which is part of Gauri's um, The American series. Um, so. And, and this has been an effort that is across the museum where Indian art is concerned. So it doesn't matter whether it's contemporary photography or contemporary uh, print or, paint or drawing or uh, textile, as in this case with uh, this Rahul Jain uh, exquisite um, uh, velvet. 
Um, but I think it's even more rewarding when we are able to work very closely with patrons uh, to acquire a work that we really want. And um, we, uh, on that trip, when several of us curators had traveled to India together, um, my colleagues from contemporary and photography had all like completely fallen in love with Nisreen. And so uh, we spent a lot of time trying to think about, you know, what Nasreen Mohammadi work we could acquire for the collection. And um, sometimes um, our uh, audiences at the Art Institute, which really does have a very renowned collection of paper, um, they often get, their eyes don't adjust to paper that has spotting or uh, any damage, you know, and a lot of paper in India, especially that has stayed, you know, that has been in collections over a period of time, tend to uh, acquire accretions. And so it was really challenging to get in a stream that kind of fitted all of our um, uh, requirements. But we were so thrilled when eventually we were able to acquire this work and our trustees, Anu and Arjun Agarwal, uh, we're able to make this uh, gift um, to help us acquire this work. And I bring up this Nasreen Mohammadi as an example that our acquisition funds are never enough to be able to acquire all of the things that we want, if not for the fact that we work very closely with our patrons um, to either sometimes, you know, get them to acquire for us something that we would like very much in a collection like this, which you know we've been spending many years trying to find the right mystery, um, or um, helping uh, them with their collections, the growth of their collections, so that uh, eventually those works could be shown at the Art Institute or could be gifted to the Art Institute and grow our collection. Because it is essential for all of you to, I think, understand is that collections develop mainly through gifts in US museums, not through acquisitions because our acquisition funds are never sufficient to um, uh, match uh, the kind of uh, range of artists that we'd like to see represented in our collections. And I'm showing you this uh, recent uh, Bhupen Kakkar uh, work uh, to men in Benares as an example of of us working with our trustees, because this was acquired by uh, one of our trustees and it's currently on view in the modern wing uh, in juxtaposition with works of the same period uh, from across the world, figurative narratives. And it is just for me, one of the, the biggest gifts is to be able to walk through the galleries and to see this Bhupen, um, you know, uh, with other greats uh, of his time, um, because this is something that left to ourselves, we could never have acquired. Um, so it's truly um, humbling sometimes to be able to see uh, what our trustees are able to acquire and how they work with us to um, enhance the way in which we are able to showcase uh, Indian art. Now, Madhu, I Madhu, can I can I stop you here? So, yes, how do you sensitize all the patrons to what they should be looking at? I mean, it's not so easy to pick and choose. So, I, I, what is the process you use that that you know introduces them to the work? Um, I think you know it's the relationship really. It's a it's a long term relationship where. We uh, know what the patrons like and we know where their interests lie. And so we really work with them to when we know about a work that is coming up or we hear from a dealer about something or we have advance notice about uh, things that are going to come up in auction. Um, uh, we work with our patrons and, and think about who it is. I mean, if we if it's a work like this one where we <laughs> so wanted it, um, but we knew that we couldn't afford to get it because you know who knows. I mean, th this broke all records when it sold. Um, and of course, as most of you know, last week 
this record was also broken by uh, the Pupin that sold at Sotheby's last week. So, um, you know, at that point, you really have to work with a trustee and you have to work with someone who, you know, would get that work because um, the subject, I mean, of Bhupin, uh, particularly the kind of, uh, you know, this, this work um, would not be appealing to every trustee, but we were very fortunate that um, our trustee who acquired this work is really passionate about uh, gay rights and he totally understood the importance of this work coming to Chicago and so um, worked with us, um, you know, you know, we're, we're just really grateful that he, he um, acquired the work and we're able to see it. So uh, moving on, um, I wanted to touch briefly on the problem that we talked about, about the moderns. And um, it has been much more difficult to develop a collection of modern art for the museum. And I want to be really specific about this for those people who may not be aware of what that issue is in Western museums. Um, I mean, to all of us growing up in India, what's the issue? I mean, you know, um, modern Indian art is modern Indian art after independence. But in fact, 1947 is um, basically post-war is contemporary, is regarded as contemporary art in the West. Um, and modernism is, is um, in the West is, uh, you know, late 19th, early 20th century art. Um, so other modernisms, these um, parts of the world that these post-colonial cultures that developed their modernism uh, in the post-colonial period, the way in which this is, comes into the representation of the story of modern art, which is really an articulation of Western art, um, has been very challenging for many museums and many departments within those museums. So it was a challenge for us. And as I said at the beginning, when I came and we were talking about the modern all the time because we were opening the modern wing, um, there was really no conversation at that time about other moderns and, and making room for other modernisms. So we started very modestly with this gift, which we were very fortunate to have um, from the grandson of Nandalal Bose of this iconic um, work of um, Gandhi on his uh, Dandi March, uh, which was gifted to us by Shupratik Bose, who sadly died very recently. Um, and as I said, this was a kind of modest beginnings um, but at that time, when I arrived, we had already received this gift of uh, this Hussein. Um, and it was a gift that was shared between the Asian and the contemporary departments. Um, and, um, but I really felt that, I mean, there was nowhere to show it. I mean, there was no conversations where we could show the Hussein. Um, it was really hard to create a conversation around other modernisms at that time because we really had not spent a lot of time uh, focused on that area in the way that we have since then. So really, it all started with educating um, through, again, exhibitions. And I was very fortunate that the government of India um, uh, decided to share with us this exhibition that they were curating of Ramdranath Tagore's own works uh, called The Last Harvest, which was a celebration that the government of India put on for Tagore's 150th birth anniversary. And so we were able to, uh, for the first time, show modern, other moderns through the works of Ramdranath Tagore himself. And this exhibition was really, really well received. And I think people were, A, for the Indians, they were just, very moved to see Tagore at the Art Institute. Incidentally, Tagore um, was a frequent visitor to Chicago uh, and to Illinois because his son, Ruthindranath, was studying and working down in Southern Illinois. And um, so Tagore would come to Chicago and in fact was there at the time of our famous armory show in 1914 when, um, uh, 13, 14, when the Art Institute was the first big museum to show uh, Impressionism in the US. 
And so Tagore talks about it and later even gives a lecture at the Art Institute. And uh, he also happened to be in Chicago when he heard about his Nobel Prize. He had a great relationship with the lady who had started the Poetry Foundation and uh, she was one of his patrons. And so it, it seemed like the right thing at the time to be showing Tagore and his own works and kickstart this conversation on moderns. Um, and that conversation has continued with our recent acquisition um, of these works uh, by the Autolit group, uh, the Shantanik Apen studies a century before us. And, you know, so I'm kind of showing you a breadth of works um, across the collection, including some recent acquisitions by our photography department, um, which has continued that dialogue on Tagore. Now coming to this Hussein, which we could not figure out what to do with because we couldn't figure out uh, whether we would ever show it. We couldn't figure out whether we would, uh, how we would show it. Um, so we would scratch our heads and look at it from time to time and realize that, you know what, we are not never going to show it. So eventually we decided to deaccession it um, because sometimes uh, museums deaccession works in order to get other works that they, you know, are likely to show. And our intention of deaccessioning this gift was very much that we wanted to acquire Hussein's that we actually could um, show in our galleries in the future. So with some of the deaccession funds, we bought this Rush the Rhine, and uh, we have continued to kind of um, develop, uh, uh, you know, South Asian contemporary as well as Indian contemporary across our collections. But in, that, in the same realm of trying to educate uh, our audiences about um, moderns, we actually decided that we would try to showcase Hussein in some form. And so um, that led to the, my curating this exhibition in 2017-18, uh, which I called India Modern, where I was showcasing a body of work, the last group of works that were done by Hussein, which are in the private collection of the Mittals. And uh, again, working with our trustees to showcase works of art that we otherwise could not uh, possibly acquire ourselves. And these works were showcased across my galleries um, in juxtaposition with ancient Indian art, because this was a series that he, um, it was a hugely ambitious series that he was working on right at the end of his life, which actually was called Indian Civilization. And as you will see, um, and, and you know, this audience understands Hussain's works very well, um, you know, the works were all about this, for example, is about Indian sculpture across the uh, ages. Um, so it really kind of meant a lot to juxtapose them against sculptures that were talking about similar subjects. Um, for most of us, we understand how Hussein, uh, Hussein's body of, the, you know, was he he'd taken this Tribhanga movement um, in which Indian sculpture um, uh, is shown uh, and had incorporated into the way he uh, represented uh, the body in his works. And so it really was very meaningful to see the works in, in conjunction, uh, speaking to each other, so to speak. And, um, uh, you know, I have to say that this, this exhibition, again, did um, attract a lot of attention. Um, but we're still searching for that great Hussein for our collection. Um, and I'd like to finish off this talk by focusing just a little bit on tradition-based contemporary art, because that has been an area that I have also been trying to develop. I am a little flummoxed by the fact that uh, for some reason, um, Indian uh, art and gallerists have not focused on this area of tradition-based Indian contemporary, because I think that there is a huge amount of scope um, in developing this area, uh, because again of that continuity of traditions that we're talking about. And so uh, increasingly we have um, added works um, into our collection um, uh, that are speaking about all kinds of subjects, but are using tradition as a way to express works um, today. And I'm, um, 
I was thrilled a little bit like that Anju Dodia story. Every time I was, I was curating a big exhibition called Gates of the Lord on Pitchwise. And every time I would spend time with Yugal Kishorji, um, whose family um, have um, been traditional uh, uh, artists from Nadwara for many generations, um, I would look at these two works uh, from the Meghdoot series that he had done, Purva Meg and Uttar Meg which was again in his personal collection and say, oh my God, these works are so beautiful. And I'd kind of like go close to it and you know, study the works. And I just couldn't get the works out of my head. Um, and eventually that led to my requesting uh, him if we could acquire them for the collection. So, you know, works of art in our collection have grown over a period of time. Um, but one of the areas that I'm really keen that we develop more on is this tradition-based area. And Gates of the Lord, this exhibition that I did on Pitchwise, really helped me kind of develop more works for the collection uh, through this. Um, because again, as I said before, um, when you do an exhibition, it's, it's easier to kind of um, focus on that area and develop it. And I wanted to um, share this work by Desmond Lazaro with all of you. It's an exquisite work that he'd done, um, which was very unusual for Indian art because what um, Desmond had done was that he took the passage uh, from the Bhagavad Puran of On Ras, but he showed it in Devanagari script as a calligraphy in the center of this work. So essentially what he was doing is showing a Ras. Um, so he, he's taking the text of the Ras, but showing it in this uh, dramatic fashion. And of course, that blue, that indigo blue of Krishna is just, just magnificent. But so is the calligraphy on it. You know, this work, one really wants to like stand close to it and look at it. It is so exquisite. So, um, you know, works of art come into our collection through many different routes. But I'm a little bit of an activist as well uh, as a curator. And so I, uh, you know, with regard to the artists of Nadwara, I have taken a much more uh, proactive role in, um, in, in uh, trying to work with the artists to ensure that uh, something that is their heritage, uh, that they get the attention for, um, because this is a tradition that has passed down all these centuries uh, because of the fact that the artists of Nadwara have preserved these traditions in their families for all these years. I think in our rush to think of the contemporary, we cannot ignore tradition-based. We need to look at contemporary across all areas. And this is something other cultures with you know, long traditions like ours across East Asia, for example, they all get. I don't understand why we don't in South Asia. So I think we really need to change the way we think. And today being the first day of Navratri, um, greetings to all of you on this wonderful occasion. I thought I'd finish with this um, uh, recent acquisition. Um, we were given a gift by the famous Chicago imagist artist, Barbara Rossi, of her collection of tribal uh, and folk and bazaar art that she'd collected from the 80s. Uh, and um, within that was this incredible energetic work by Sri Gauri Chitrakar. Um, uh, Gauri Chitrakar and her family and other artists all worked in the pot tradition, but here was a work that she'd done on paper. And uh, I thought it seemed like an appropriate time to, um, uh, to finish our talk with this uh, today because these are the artists that we cannot marginalize. These are the artists that we need to treasure and we need to acquire along with the renowned Indian contemporary and modern artists as well. So that's my little plea to all of you uh, as I finish this talk today. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. And that was such a beautiful way to end this because I mean, this, this, these are the other masters, aren't they? They really I, are. I think they have been there have been some shows with uh, with the other masters that have been uh, seen in different parts, and I think the focus is coming back to them, 
And I think we're seeing a lot of revival in this area. So you won't be disappointed. But we, I mean, not just revival. Revival only happens if we not only start collecting them, put them into our collections, but also we need to look at the prices we pay for them. We need to like treat them with the respect that they deserve. I think that's happening because when you look at artists that are coming out now, you can see uh, the prices. The, some of the artists are getting very good prices. I think this is changing. It's slowly yeah. changing. Yeah. Um, should I, uh, Sharon, should I stop the share now and so that uh, maybe we can all look at each other's faces as we... If you want, but this is such a beautiful image, we can continue to look at it. It's really <laughs> lovely. But okay. let, me, let, me, let me take these questions that are coming up for you because sure. we, we'll take questions. Okay, so the first question is, according to you, what would be the role of the contemporary artist in relation to tradition as far as the public understanding is concerned? So I think this well, is a little bit about what you've been talking about, but how does the, how does the contemporary artist, I think, get into this entire area? Well, I think for artists, they, they source their inspiration from anywhere and everywhere. And there are many contemporary artists who in fact have looked at tradition, uh, including the living traditions, um, to, um, for their own practice. I mean, you've got great examples like Nilima Sheikh, who we were talking about, Ramachandra. I mean, there's so many, even Bhupen himself. Um, so I think artists are much more open to looking across, you know, anything and being inspired. But I think we uh, are still inspired, you know, kind of, we tend to think about uh, art in boxes. You know, and, and I put that a lot back to, you know, art school education, uh, the lack of art school education in, in our classrooms, um, and this kind of um, uh, wanting to put tradition in one box, contemporary in another, why? They're all the same, ours is a living culture. You know, it continues to evolve through the times and just like artists are inspired by everything, so are we. So, you know, today I might feel like wearing something contemporary. Tomorrow I might want to wear a traditional whatever. Um, can I not do all of those things? Aren't we all living in many generations, uh, many centuries all at the same time? So I think that we've got to be a little bit more open in, and, and of course, you know, there's personal taste within collecting, of course. I understand that. But I don't understand why in the commercial realm, um, we don't have more galleries competing for that part of the market. Um, and why do we have to uh, acquire certain artists in hearts? Why, um, or, you know, I mean, it's, some artists are so difficult to acquire in the public space. My plea to all the uh, galleries is, let's put everyone on an even platform and let people acquire what they want to acquire. I think that's a great way of looking at it. I think the next question we have is, how do we bridge the gap between the past and the present? Um, I think education is really important here. And uh, I, I'm doing a current study on uh, the state of Indian art um, using 2020 as a, as a kind of marker to look back, but also to look forward. And I, I'm quite amazed at the number of art colleges, for example, that have mushroomed all across India. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm concerned about uh, us not studying Indian art uh, across the uh, centuries within these art colleges because so much of the curriculum tends to be Western. I think um, we have to be taught and educated about um, our own traditions because if we treat our monuments or our heritage as something to be desecrated or to be, um, you know, scribbled on, then there's something wrong with the way we're being educated. And I think it's, it's, Tradition is not only about sanskar, it is, you know, sanskar extends to how we think about our past, how we think about our built heritage, how we think about our living traditions, respecting all of that, and, and at the same time, uh, moving with the times. I don't think that the two things have to be separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess. I'm a so great believer in 
with having a foot in either camp why do i need to choose can i not have it all <laughs> correct absolutely absolutely so we have two more questions one i think yeah. you've covered in some ways it says um could you tell us how you perceive modernity modernism and contemporary in terms of indian art from the perspective of a museum or a curator but that's something like you've already touched on so let me yeah. go to this uh thing is do you have a formal network in india who help you identify what works you want to acquire for the institute no not at all uh i think every curator has their own personal networks but um i don't want to talk about what i might be acquiring or what i'm trying to place somewhere uh those are very personal and very private conversations um a, a curator's job a, a curator with an institution we have um a certain responsibilities and certain codes of conduct of how we have to behave and how we need to behave within the field and we can't impact the prices of certain things um uh by i mean i i'm just trying to of course encourage everyone to pay more for tradition uh contemporary but at the same time i mean because i think it's important that the artists who create works are paid you know a certain amount uh and that they stop being nameless but at the same time uh what we are working on or what we might be acquiring is something that i don't tend to talk about at all um only the person that i'm working with at that time might know about it um until it's been acquired one doesn't talk about it that's interesting so we have quite a few questions i'm going to pick something that is different uh how necessary is public perception and popularity in bring, bringing such contemporary indian art works which are usually overlooked by the heavily west influenced art market to the forefront of the art world ensuring that the contribution of such works is duly recorded and carried out in society very it's superbly important but you know um while i can say that it's really important we also collectively have a responsibility you can't sit there and expect a western curator to be collecting and knowing about everything across the world uh and i think that uh where indian contemporary is concerned because that is what today's talk is about um i think we have a responsibility in ensuring that we help those institutions collect indian art indian contemporary art or modern art Uh, and that by that i mean our uh, patrons uh, you know we all work together as a community because we believe that our institutions collections should be global should be representing you know the communities that live in chicago land but also a wider community the international community but we as i i demonstrated through this talk we have to work on this strategically because if we wanted to acquire those works at the same time we have pressure to acquire works from all across the world um so number one we've got to um work with those institutions to ensure that uh you know those works get placed we need to collectively work to fund exhibitions and we need to generate more exhibitions within india as well um that can travel across the world so that that um you know we might think x or y is a great artist well hello what have we done to help that artist get to get better known um you know we can't just leave this to dealers and to art galleries to support the art scene that's not their job their job is to sell art it is our job as curators or collectors or patrons to actually make that uh, that work of art go into an institution or to be exhibited somewhere so i think we we can't like divorce ourselves from that job and and thank god there are new museums coming up in india which hopefully will play that role because a museum's job is to create that understanding of um these artists in those communities so it it a curator works across a community to educate that community through the exhibitions that we mount and then you can hope to acquire those works for your permanent collection 
I think education becomes a very large part of the job, right? And yeah. museums, I mean, after all, you people are living museums and living museums are part of the part of this entire thing is to engage with the public. And whether we're a gallerist or just a visitor, that engagement continues and then gets translated into what you're talking about. Yeah, which is like a perfect example is this uh, TAP platform, you know? So uh, it, it's, it's through platforms um, that we educate, but at the same time, we can't leave it all to the, the private space to do this. I mean, we, we've got to kind of create that dialogue between the public space and the private space so that this is not just about the co commercial. It, it, I think increasingly foundations in India need to play a role more than they have been. Um, I think actively everybody needs to play a role. Anyone who cares about the arts needs to play a role. You know, one thing, um, uh, Madhu, I have to say that in America, your tax laws encourage this foundation building and giving. And I think the moment we see that change in India, things will happen because I think people in India are acquisitive, but not so generous about giving to museums but, because that's not so much in our culture. But that's but changing. Sharon, uh, no, but Sharon, the thing is, see, um, government doesn't give you things unless you ask for it. Um, in yes. America, things didn't happen because government just generously said, hello, take these uh, tax benefits, right? It happened because collectors got together and lobbied. And that's what we've got to do. I mean, when collectors lobby to bring art that they're buying outside of India into India, then things move. So people can't just passively sit there and say, oh, nothing's happening, but I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit at home and buy whatever I want because I just want to have a beautiful home and gaze at look great art. And oh yeah, I can go to museums when I go abroad. No, hello. You've got no, to no, actively right. work to create right. that change in your community if you believe in that change. Right. So similarly, government that. will give that if you fight government for it, if you go and lobby government for those tax benefits. And that can happen too. Yeah, if it's that's happening. Really I think it's happening from what I can understand. I think we're all trying to do that. And I think it's slowly making its impact because, you know, the, what the government has tried to do with setting up all these buildings that they're giving over to the public is, is the beginning of that, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Exactly. you know, it, it does it does benefit the public at the end. So yeah. I think this has been an absolutely fabulous conversation. You've given us Thank a lot you. of food for thought. And thank you so much for giving us your ideas and letting us into your wonderful world. I mean, how else would we have known about how all these patrons are supporting you and we, we need to encourage the same similar things. We need to take a page out of your book and do the same thing here. So thank well, you, Madhu. Sharon, thank you. Uh, you've been such a great um, support and I wish this platform all the great success and um, yes, a shout out to all my patrons. But I would say that none of us, uh, all the curators who work in American institutions, none of us could do what we do without our patrons. So I would love to see such an active patronage in India too, very, very soon. Yeah, on more that to note. that. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's cheer to that. And thank you, thank you again. And we, we hope to see you back on our TAP Talks. So we're going to try and do the TAP Talks on Thursdays so that we don't clash with other things on the weekend and we want you back again. So we talked about a few ideas when we were talking initially. So I think we should, we should pursue that and see what we can do, what more we can do together. That'll be okay? wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And good night. Thanks and have a great weekend for the rest of the weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, Molly. Bye.